Uh, the reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, you can found on page 1000, and it will begin from verse 57, chapter 27. Book of Matthew, page 1000, chapter 27, beginning at verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who, ha- who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it, that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had had been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. We're going to continue uh, uh, right to the end of chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers brothers to go. Go to Galilee, there I will see them. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers large sums of money, telling them, you are to say that his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the, so the soldiers took money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Great. Right, if you've got a Bible, it'd be great if you turn back to that reading conveniently on page 1000. And let's pray that God would help us to understand this great event. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the resurrection of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please would you help us to indeed understand the significance and the meaning of this event. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is quite simply the most important event ever 
in human history. Now, that's quite a claim. You might think there are other things. Now, why do I say that? Well, at one level, because it answers the question about death. Is there a way past death? In our series, Bible Studies in Ecclesiastes, we've been thinking about death, the fact that each of us dies, and if we're going to make sense of life, then we have to make sense of our own death. And Jesus' resurrection begins to answer that question, is there a way past death? And it also explains why it is that Jesus should be the central figure in all of our lives. Again, that's a staggering claim. Why should Jesus be central in all our lives? And that's what we're thinking about in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Clearly, it's the most significant event in history. Millions and millions and millions of people all over the world will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead today. <clears throat> Christianity, apart from, probably apart from in Europe, Christianity is growing as fast as it ever has in other parts of the world. In Africa, in South America, in Asia, in North America... China, the gospel is growing fast. Christians, people are becoming Christians uh, at great pace. Our aim basically this morning is very simple, is to come back to one of the original eyewitness accounts of the resurrection and to see uh, what happened and what its significance is. Because I think one of the dangers for us in the West is one of complacency. That we sort of go, it's part of our culture. Well, sort of in, sometime in March or April, there's a weekend, the uh, Easter weekend, and we get a bank holiday on the Friday, and we get a bank holiday on the Monday. And, um, well, that's very nice, and we can get on with whatever we like doing. I guess the DIY shops all hope that we're going to go and give them a lot of business in the garden centres. But there's something far, far more significant than DIY and gardening. If we understand that Jesus rose from the dead, then we cannot be unmoved. I want to exhort you, encourage you to take the resurrection of Jesus Christ seriously. Well, let's uh, just work it through. So on Friday, we thought about his death. And I guess the key moment in terms of our thinking about the resurrection is the fact that he was dead. So in verse 50, just back over the page, we read that Jesus... Uh, cried again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. So we thought on Friday about how Jesus' death brings us forgiveness and access to God and peace with God. It's a fantastic and a wonderful moment. Let's pick up the story now on with the fact that Jesus is dead and buried. So as evening approached, let's pick it up in verse 57, where Tarek read from. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself became a disciple of Jesus. He goes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. And Pilate ordered that the body should be given to him. In Mark's account, we read that Pilate actually checked with the centurion who'd been guarding Jesus to make sure that he really was dead. Verse 59, Joseph then takes the body down and wraps it in a linen shroud and places it in a new tomb, verse 60, that he cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Two of the ladies who've been following Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, were sitting there opposite the tomb. So we read of of Joseph taking the tomb, taking the body, placing it in the tomb, rolling the big stone in front so that it couldn't be moved. Again, if if you've got one of the kids' questions, again, there's a reward of a chocolate for colouring sheets and the kids' questions. And the first kids' question is, what did Joseph do with the body? What did Joseph do? do with the body again the rewards are only for the children so jesus is dead and buried matthew then records a further step that the authorities take to ensure that it stays that way verse 62 the next day 
one, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they go to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, that's what they call Jesus, said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. And so they take a guard, verse 65. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So here we read of the authorities. They remember this extraordinary, outrageous claim that Jesus had made that he would rise from the dead. And so they request a guard to secure the tomb with some sort of seal. They make the tomb as secure as they can. Jesus is dead and buried and his tomb is secure. As secure as humans can make it. And at this point in the story, it just feels like it is all over. Jesus and the movement that he had started so brilliantly in Galilee is finished. It's dead and buried and gone. And then we come to this extraordinary events of the Sunday morning. Jesus, dead and buried, Jesus is risen. Chapter 28 and verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb to look for Jesus. So to look at the tomb. Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. Well, I wonder what you make of those words of verse 2. There's a violent earthquake, an angel comes down rolls the stone away and sits on. His appearance is like lightning. His clothes are as white as snow. What do you make of that? I think many in our culture, sadly, would just switch off at this point. That's impossible, they would say. That's just make-believe. There aren't angels. There isn't a supernatural. Miracles like this don't happen. Resurrections don't happen. There must be some other explanation. Maybe as you sit there, if you're honest, that is what's going on in your heart. You're saying, this is just not believable. And certainly when I was growing up, that was what, how I thought about Jesus and his resurrection. I thought there wasn't any supernatural, and uh, Jesus must have remained dead. But I just want to push back against that view, that view that there are no angels, there's no miracles, there's no supernatural because it's all based on the assumption, I'm going to cheekily say, say it's all based on an act of faith, that there is no God, that there is no personal creator, that the whole universe came from nothing, and that life in all its extraordinary complexity started by chance and has continued to develop by chance. But if there is such a God, if there is such a creator, if there is an all-powerful God who brought this world into existence, who started life, who shapes life, who loves and sustains life. And I think that seems far more plausible than the explanation that something came from nothing and that incredibly complex life started and developed by chance. If there is such a God, then the events described in verse 2 are entirely plausible. That this great creator God did indeed send a powerful angel. He was indeed capable of rolling the stone away, capable of terrifying the guards. Let's go on. Verse 5. Sorry, Peter. So the guards in verse 4 were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
The women are understandably terrified by this scene, <coughs> this great angel's dazzling appearance. And he wants to reassure them, do not be afraid, he says. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. Again, there's the emphasis on Jesus dead. Do not be afraid, he says. I know you're looking for Jesus, the crucified. Again, we're reminded Jesus being crucified. And then comes the staggering sentence. He is not here. He has risen. He is not here. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. He has risen. We're going to say this together because this, if you go away with nothing else today, then just go away with this. Okay? Children, you're going to follow that as well? Let's say this together. He is not here. He has risen. Say that again. He is not here. He has risen. Uh, second kids question. We're doing the kids questions. What did the angel say had happened to Jesus? What did the angel say had happened to Jesus? So here we are, the one you saw crucified, says the angel. The one you watched being taken down from the cross, laid in the tomb. The one you saw being entombed by that great stone. He is no longer in that tomb. Why? He has risen. And here is the heart of this extraordinary Easter event. The angel reminds the women that Jesus has repeatedly said that that would happen. Again and again, the gospel tells his followers, look, I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise again from the dead. It's going to happen. And then the angel invites the women to come and see the evidence for themselves. Come into the tomb. See what's happening there. See that that rock, that slab on which the body was, the body is no longer there. Look at the evidence for yourselves. And can I encourage you, if you're thinking about these things for the first time, we have a little booklet called The Evidence for the Resurrection on the table. Please do grab a copy on the way out. There's a slightly longer book talking about the evidence of the resurrection, but I'll offer you the, sort, the, sh the shorter one at this stage. Verse 7, let's pick up the story again. Verse 7. Then go quickly, says the angel, and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So he tells them to go to the disciples, that they are going to go to Galilee and there see him, be reunited with him and be reconciled with him. Verse 8, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they run to tell his disciples. And then they meet Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Verse 9, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Here is the glorious moment. They've been told it, and now they see it for themselves. Jesus, risen from the dead, fall and worship at his feet. If Jesus, who says he's God's son and Messiah, if he's conquered death and risen again, then he is worthy of worship and praise and adoration. If we understand that Jesus has risen from the dead, then that should be our response as well, one of worship. Now my next kid's question, third kid's question, who did the women meet? Who did the women meet? And as we watch them worship Jesus, I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I worshipping Jesus? Here is God's son risen from the dead. He is the one we should be worshipping and serving. The New Testament will give us plenty of further evidence for the resurrection. It's in this little booklet. But there are further appearances. At one time, Jesus appeared to a group of over 500 people. The appearances occur over a period of about 40 days to individuals, to groups, as I said, at one point to 500. The appearance includes people seeing his wounds, touching his wounds, eating with him. And I say, I encourage you, please do take that booklet and read it and see the evidence for the resurrection. But let's go on. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see him. He wants to reassure them. 
Do not be afraid. Yes, I'm all powerful, but I'm also all loving. I am for you. I love you. Go and tell his disciples. <clears throat> and then the scene switches to the guards, and I've entitled this The Deception of the Leaders. Verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city <clears throat> and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had made, met with the elders, they devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while they were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, they will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. <clears throat> Back in uh, chapter 27 and verse 63 at the bottom of the other column, they talked about the fact that Jesus was a deceiver. They called him a deceiver. But now it is the, the rulers who are deceiving in their uh, pushing forward of this lie. But some will say, well, hang on, maybe this is, is, is what did happen. Some may argue that maybe that is what happened, that the disciples did come and steal the body and... Uh, then claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. Is that possible? Well, I think there are two reasons why that is just not really possible. The first one is, would the disciples really have come and, and taken on a Roman guard to steal the body? That seems unlikely. And then the question is one, which I think is even more important, it's the question of motivation. Why steal the body? Because all they did after this was to face hostility and persecution and death. For what purpose? For something they knew there was a lie. On YouTube, there is a video of everything. So I was mucking on YouTube yesterday, and there was a video, or it's just a very clever scene, of uh, Peter, one of the apostles, and John, and the group of the apostles. And Peter is arguing that they should steal the body and... Um, and then John goes, what happens next after we've stolen the body? And Peter goes, we get killed. <laughs> and John looks like Quisdom and goes, what? Uh, do we get any glory or fame or money? No, we just get killed. And then Peter lists all the different ways that the apostles were killed. It just doesn't make sense. People can today can die for what they believe uh, is true. But in that day, they actually knew People don't die for something they know to be alive. There's nothing in it for them. The idea they stole the body and then uh, told people about the resurrection just doesn't make sense. Why? All they had was persecution and hostility in this life. So it seems unlikely that they could have done it, that they could have overpowered the Roman guards, and it seems even more unlikely that they would have done it. There's no point to die and be persecuted for something you know is a lie. And then we come to the great finale, as Jesus explains the meaning of the resurrection, the authority of the risen Jesus overall. Let's read verse 16 together. Let's look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples uh, went to Galilee, <clears throat> to the mountain where Jesus had told them. When he saw them, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here we get the disciples meeting with Jesus. Some worship. They've seen Jesus risen from the dead, the one they call their Messiah, the Son of God. They worship him. But we're told that some doubted. I love the realism of this account. <clears throat> it seems that some of the disciples, understanding, were still coming to terms with what was going on in front of them. Here is Jesus risen from the dead. Can this really be possible? Is it what's going on? It would take time for them really to get hold of it. Still struggling to get their hands in. And then Jesus speaks. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And here Jesus draws the conclusion, the important implications of the resurrection. And it is a staggering claim that he makes. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not some authority, not a bit of authority, not a bit of authority over this part of the world, but not that part of the world. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. God the Father, God the Creator has given his Son all authority over the universe. That is what the resurrection demonstrates. He's clearly given him authority over death. My final kids question. How much authority has, Jesus, has God given Jesus? How much authority has God given Jesus? Which means, of course, that Jesus has been given authority over each one of us sitting here or standing here, including me. All authority includes authority over Wanstead, over London, over everywhere. Jesus is saying, because of the resurrection, because of the authority God has given me, I have the right to reign over your lives. My resurrection is a sure sign that God the Father has given me all authority in the world, over every person in the world. The authority to rule us, to judge us, to save us. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Sometimes people say, why are Christians so keen on going and telling the gospel to people? Can't they just leave people in peace? Well, here is the answer. Jesus has been given all authority. And so he tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so if we're believers here, we're called to go to the nations, to go to Wanstead, to Leighton, to Woodford, to Stratford, into London, to the rest of the world, to make disciples, to encourage, to exhort, to urge people that they need to see the resurrection. They need to see Jesus as the one who has authority over them and over the whole world. So we need to turn back and be his disciples, to hear his teaching, to obey everything that he has commanded. So if we understand Easter correctly, if we understand the resurrection correctly then it should change our lives. We can't just say, oh, it's a nice bank holiday weekend that remembers this odd Christian event. No, we have to say that Jesus rose from the dead, God's son, and because of that, all authority has been given to him. Well, what are the implications for us? If, we're, if, we're, if you're a believer here this morning, if you call yourself a Christian, then I'm fantastic that you hold that Jesus rose from the dead. That's great. And so I just want to encourage you and exhort you to be his disciple. I think we can be, as Christians, we can often say, well, I'll let Jesus reign over this part of my life. I'll let him have authority over my Sundays and and maybe a day or two in the week or something. But we can just sort of put him on one side. We can't do that. All authority has been given to Jesus. We're called to be his disciples 24-7. And if you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a believer, And I exhort you to see that Jesus really did rise from the dead. That's what the evidence points to. There really is a God who made us, who gives us everything. He really raised Jesus from the dead. And he has given him authority over the universe, over us. And so I want to urge you and encourage you that you need to become a disciple of Jesus's. If you think, I need a bit of time to think about this, then please do take one of these Evidence of the Resurrection booklets. Maybe think about joining that course that Gerald and Carol are going to be running in a couple of weeks' time. But please don't go out here saying, oh, it's okay, I can just leave it on one side. It doesn't really matter. We need to become Jesus' disciples and do what he teaches us. That is the meaning of Easter. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We praise you that he has risen. He is no longer in the tomb. We praise you that after he died for, our, uh, died for our sins, he was raised. And we praise you. <clears throat> that means that you have given him all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority over each one of us here. And so we pray that you would help us to be his disciples. 
to listen to his teaching, to obey his teaching in our lives. And Father, Jesus called his disciples to go out into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. And your church has continued to do that throughout the years, and we praise you for the millions and millions of Christian disciples that are all around the world seeking to obey his teaching. And so, Father, we pray for your help as we seek to continue to make disciples in Wanstead and the surrounding areas. We, we support our missionaries seeking to make disciples in Italy and Central Asia. Father, we pray for your blessing upon them this day, that may your gospel continue to grow and spread. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.